I'm Craig Lawless. I'm Kevin Garcia-King. And this is Sounds Like Infrastructure. The Culture Forum Madrid is located in one of the most iconic areas of the city, an area art lovers across the Spanish capital are familiar with, an area known across the world for three of Spain's most iconic art museums. And those three museums created three points about a mile apart, which became known as the Triangulo del Arte. But more recently, this triangle of art has gotten a new nickname, the Mile of Art, because in 2008, those three museums got a new neighbour. And it's safe to say that this neighbour does not look like any of the other museums. The top section is an orangey rusted iron, the central section is old industrial brick, and the bottom section, well, there is no bottom section. It looks like they just chopped off the base of the building. It looks like it's floating. It looks like it's just hovering on this spectacular piece of Madrid, almost as if it knows it shouldn't be there. That's Lexi. My name is Lexi Hadfield. I am a Madrid-based writer and historian. And we got in touch with Lexi to talk about the Caixa Forum, a 10,000 square meter museum that emerges from the shell of an old industrial power station. It's a very impressive building. You see, you, you hear the heads turn as people walk past the Caixa Forum. The Central Electrica de Mediodía is this classic industrial style building that was built in 1899. Very traditional brick, almost mill style building. And it was built to provide electricity to the area around it, which at the time was on the edge of the city, an area that is now very much the centre of Madrid, only a five minute walk to Retiro Park and the Atocha train station. So this electricity plant that was literally powering the area surrounding it jump forward a hundred years and it's left completely abandoned. This old industrial contrasting building in what was quickly becoming one of Madrid's most beautiful, artsy and prestigious areas to be and to live. And then in the early 2000s, the building would catch a break because it caught the eye of La Caixa, a Spanish bank that had these Caixa Forum culture centers and museums dotted around Spain. And La Caixa saw the building not as an old abandoned power station, but as the next step to growing their Caixa Forum offering. What they realized, that nobody had up to this point, was that this building had a lot of potential. Not only that, but its proximity to the Paseo del Prado, to Spain's most famous museums, well, it was an opportunity they couldn't miss. So they made an offer for the building. An offer that was accepted on the one condition that they kept the history of this building's industrial past alive. And that one little clause in the contract would end up making this building one of the most unusual you will ever see. A building designed by Herzog and de Muren that stayed true to its industrial past, but at the same time looks really, really modern. On this episode of Sounds Like Infrastructure, we ask how an abandoned and almost forgotten power station was turned into one of the most recognizable buildings in Madrid. For this project to work, Ferrovia would need to turn 2,000 square meters into 10,000, make the museum look like it was levitating, and completely re-engineer the building's structural integrity. How they build the Caixa Forum Madrid? Next. The Central Electrica de Mediodía was built in 1899, just off one of Madrid's busiest but also most iconic roads, the Paseo del Prado. Which is a long, leafy road, still very central, next to the Retiro Park, which was historically outside of the city. That's where the royals had their summer residence, when it was just way too hot in the city, city centre. They moved outside of the city wall and had their residence out there. So it is central now but it's cool, it's leafy. And in the early 20th century, there were new buildings in this area that needed that new modern must-have, electricity. So they built a power station, a quintessentially industrial power station. Where I grew up, those suburban parts of Manchester tended to be based around buildings just like that, with the pitched roofs, few floors, not an awful lot of glass, no windows and doors really, almost a scary down-to-business kind of structure. And the building was surrounded by these narrow streets typical of Madrid, one of which led directly onto the Paseo del Prado. And so it made perfect sense that La Caixa would want to use it as their new cultural home. 
This area beside the Paseo del Prado meant their neighbours would be the Prado itself, the Thyssen, and the Reina Sofia, three of Madrid's most famous museums. An ideal location if you want to join the iconic museum club. But there was a small problem. The building wasn't exactly on the Paseo del Prado. It was almost on the Paseo del Prado. Which was a problem for the Caixa Foreign Master Plan, because that master plan included an address on the Paseo del Prado, something that didn't come with the building when they bought it. But we'll get to how they solved that in a bit. To understand why La Caixa wanted this building so bad, you've got to understand that they had already been in the art world for quite a few years by this time. Not hundreds of years like the Prado opposite, but a couple of decades at least. In fact, La Caixa Foundation was a pioneer managing exhibitions of modern and contemporary art in Madrid since the 80s. That's Isabel. My name is Isabel Fuentes. I am the director of Caixa Forum Madrid since 2009. And although these locations had worked up until now, the foundation was looking for something different, something they could call their own, something that would leave a mark on the city. Well, La Caixa was looking for a singular building in a unique and strategic place. The old power station met these conditions. And so? The aim was save the building and repurpose it and the space around it, all of them for the city. Not only that, but they had a number of specific requirements the building would have to live up to. If you're going to do it, you may as well do it right. Well, the main task was to design a singular building combining the old and the new. They had to respect the brick structure on the, of the old power station and they had also to increase the useful space. With these boxes to tick, La Caixa got looking for the people who could design this new museum. And that's when they found the Swiss duo Herzog and the Murin. So the architects had already taken on a challenge to convert a, an industrial power station and make it an art gallery. This wasn't the first time they tackled a project like this. They had done so wildly successfully just a few years before. And what was that building? It was a Tate Modern in London. And for La Caixa, that meant Herzog and the Muran would be the perfect fit because... It was important to have an architectural studio with previous experience in the rehabilitation of all industrial buildings. And the Tate wasn't the only industrial building the architects had worked on. They had actually built up quite a fame for their work on renovating industrial buildings, just like the Central de Mediodía. They were two of the most sought-after architects of the time. They were at the peak of their career. They had just won the Pritzker Prize, basically the Oscars of architecture. And... They had an abundance of experience taking these old industrial buildings, making them something new, giving them a new purpose with that clear and respectful nod to their past. So when La Caixa hired Herzog and de Muren, they designed a building that would not only be unique, but would respect this industrial past. They decided they would keep the facade of the building and would build up and down to get that extra space that was needed. But they also decided to do something that would completely change the look of the building. They decided that they would get rid of the entire granite base that the walls of the building stood on, change the whole structural core, and make the Caixa Forum look like it was floating. But Herzog and the Muren would only be one half of the process. They would need someone to actually build this floating building. And that's when Ferrovia got on board. And with Ferrovia now on board and the Herzog and the Muren design finalized, there was one question on everybody's lips. Everybody wondered how we were going to suspend the building. That's Juan Luis Junguito, who at the time managed Ferrovial's projects in this area of Madrid. And that question of how to suspend the building while you removed its base was an important one. Herzog and de Muren had initially proposed using a type of buttress to keep the old facade in place during the work. But after a bit of research, the Ferrovial team found that using a technique called micropiling would be a more straightforward option. The micropiling would allow the facade of the building to be supported by lots and lots of thin steel bars. And these would act as a temporary foundation while the old granite base of the building was being removed, section by section. We had to, to do it uh, in uh, small alternate trenches. The space to, to work was not uh, uh, huge and we, it was uh, quite difficult. But once the micropiling was in place and the granite base removed, the whole perimeter was on air. 
when there was only the micro panel you could you could see uh, underneath uh, the the whole building wasn't it and then we built up the the interior concrete wall once the granite base was removed and so the old facade would be permanently supported by this new interior wall by an interior concrete post stress wall poured against uh, the existing facade and all around it this wall was connected to the old facade by connectors made of corrugated steel on a two square meters surface basis. This concrete wall was then attached by beams to the three newly built structural cores of the building. And Juan Luis says it's good to imagine these cores a little like a chair. Well, like a three leg chair, which is a very visual. Uh, the building was finally supported by a three vertical structure, which allowed the building staircases inside. And these cores that house the staircases and lifts are located slightly towards the back of the building, which means that you barely see them from the front, which is why it looks like the Caixa Forum is floating. Today the Caixa Forum has this big public square in front of it, but that wasn't the case when Ferrobio started working on the project. Like Juan Luis mentioned, they were working between narrow streets in the very center of the Spanish capital. We're talking about streets so narrow there was barely anywhere to put the on-site offices. They literally had to put them on stilts and have them up in the air. But as the building began to levitate and the project moved forward, there was still one piece of the puzzle missing. One piece of the Caixa Forum master plan that had not yet been solved. The coveted spot on the Paseo del Prado. So the Caixa Forum have found the perfect space on the perfect road. But there is one thing in the way. Something that not only restricts the amount of space they have to work with, but does actually block their access to this coveted street and it was a petrol station right between the old electricity plant and the paseo itself. A land exchange had to be carried out with the owners of the gas station in order to open this new public square. La Caixa decided they would make an offer to buy the petrol station with the idea of knocking it down and creating a new space that would finally connect the building to the Paseo del Prado. At this point, the micropiling was already in place and the new core structures were being connected to the old facade. So the site of the petrol station and the original building were actually working as two separate sites. The idea was to demolish the petrol station and extend the basement of the building into the land under this new square. The construction process itself was pretty straightforward. Uh, the excavation method was uh, traditional when working in um, built up areas diaphragm wall and uh, metallic contention beams. But the main problem we found uh, was the management of the contaminated soil we found uh, uh, below the station. Soil that had been contaminated from years of fuel storage beneath the surface of the petrol station. A problem that Juan Luis and the team quickly resolved to keep the project moving forward. After knocking down the petrol station and decontaminating the soil, there was one more complication. And it wasn't actually a structural complication, but a visual one. While the petrol station was filling a space that they wanted, what they didn't expect was once it was gone, how unsightly that area would be. So now they need to decide how to make this space they wanted so desperately look the way they want it to look. The main problem was that the neighboring wall the petrol station had been attached to was now imposing itself on the square. It looked out of place and it would be the first thing that most people would see when they arrived at the museum. Once the square was opened and the petrol station was removed, we still had a large party wall in the neighboring building, and we needed an innovative and sustainable aesthetic solution. It was not easy. And after going through a few options, they finally settled on one. They would cover the wall with a vertical garden designed by Patrick Blank. Famous for his vertical gardens in cities such as Paris, New York, Bangkok and New Delhi. A 460 square meter vertical garden with 15,000 plants and no soil. It's an incredible piece of art and architecture. Every day we see people taking photos and I don't have Instagram, but people say that it's probably one of the most things in Madrid in Instagram. And Isabel is not hyping up the vertical garden here at all. It really is one of the most photographed things in the city because it's not inside the museum. It's a piece of art for the city. And incredible to think that it was a solution to a problem found halfway through the project. 
The picture that you'll find all over Instagram is the vertical garden on one half of the image and the old industrial building on the other, the organic and the industrial plane together. But above the stone facade is another iconic element, a rusted steel wall that houses the extra space built above the original building. Behind the sheets of rusted steel that come directly out of the old pitched roof is an exhibition space. And as the steel rises to the top, you start to see all these little holes that have been machined into the metal. And behind this, on the top floor, is of course, the customary museum cafe. It's a hodgepodge of materials. Somehow it works, but you've got a bottom space with nothing. A middle bit that's a well-worn, authentic nod to the past of an industrial building and then the steel used at the top. So it looks peculiar, it looks cobbled together almost, but you look at why and how those pieces are used, it just makes perfect sense. There's also a few nods to the industrial past once you make your way inside the Kaixia Forum, but the piece of architecture that grabs your attention most once inside is the staircase. The stair was made, the staircase was made of a white structural concrete. It was designed by Herzog and de Meron, who didn't want any work joints. The staircase actually only covers four floors. But the, the, the height of the floor, as it's a museum, it's uh, about four, four meters, fifty, uh, four and a half meters, as I remember. Which means that this pristine, white, curved staircase rises about 24 meters in total. Juan Luis joked that the team thought they had already completed the most challenging part of the project when they made the building look like it was levitating. And then they got to the staircase. Well, it was a design, uh, a, a challenge because we have to combine aesthetics, important for an architect, with uh, structure calculations and uh, the fact that the stair had to work and, and, uh, and stay upright. You don't quite spiral up, but you do circle your way up. There are steps, but it's very smooth, long, wide steps. And you have to go slowly up them. You can't just run up these stairs. You have to take each step at a time, which I think really connects and grounds you with the building. You can't just whiz up to the top. You have to take your time exploring this building. Whether it's the stairs, the facade, or the vertical garden, the Caixa Forum has become one of the most well-known buildings in Madrid. And even though the idea was to make something unique for the city, we were not aware that it would become a reference point in the city as it has happened. And the building has probably become a landmark because one of the first questions you ask yourself when you see it is, how did they build this thing? The result was a bold, attractive and light building. Uh, a building, but also a sculpture. Ferrovial was the best partner for the execution of the project. They modernized the area and cleaned it up a little bit without gentrifying it. So yes, there is a nice cafe now across the road so that when you've been in exploring, you can go straight for a coffee, but it's not Starbucks. It's an independent Spanish run cafe. It's inspiring that area, whether you're an artist or not. But if you are an artist, what better place to have your studio or your little shop or your exhibition space, but in that coveted, famous art district of Madrid. The galleries, there are some great bookshops, art bookshops. It feels like it's welcomed in a whole bunch of people to that area, but again, without gentrifying it. Museums are the envelope for something beautiful, so they, they must be a beautiful envelope and they are very, very special. Yeah, but it's uh, one of the most special projects I've been uh, involved. Yeah. Sounds Like Infrastructure is a collaboration between Ferrovial and Valletta Media. Our team includes Kevin Garcia King, Jose Garcia Guaita, Arancho Gulias, Teresa Bino, Manuel Sanchez Medina, and myself, Craig Lawless. We want to say a big thanks to Lexi, Juan Luis, and Isabel for talking to us for this episode. And of course, if you know anybody who you think would like the show, share it with them. I'm Kevin Garcia King. I'm Craig Lawless. And this is Sounds Like Infrastructure.